Thanks, Ben. Okay, I've got the graveyard shift and I'm well aware I'm the only thing that is standing between you guys and drinks. Uh, but I do have a bucket load of stuff to talk about. So I just need to make sure everybody's brain is awake and engaged. So if you get anything in your hands, just pop it down for a second, please. Because I need everybody to copy me. Okay, that should be your right hand out. How many people have got their left hand out? Right now with your left hand, point your finger at me. So right thumb up finger out with your left hand. Now, just a quick check to see if your brain is still working after a long day. Switch. I'm back. And again, and again, and again. And that should be quite simple if your brain is working. Yes? No? Okay. All right. So, what I'm going to talk about now is mental fitness. Let me first start with the problem statement. We are currently the most overweight, most depressed, most medicated, and most addicted cohort of adults that there's ever been. Not specifically in this room, I'm talking about Australia across the board. But life has never been so good. We are going through what can only be described as a twin physical and mental health crisis, yet we have it easier than all of our ancestors. So clearly something is wrong with modern life. And for me, a lot of it comes down to this picture. This is what your genome and my genome is wired for, being a hunter-gatherer. And the, the human genome has not changed in over 45,000 years. And this genome of ours requires and expects us to do certain things for normal functioning, such as move lots, and we don't move very much anymore. Eat real food, and most of the stuff that we eat is ultra-processed crap also expects us to be exposed to certain stressors and then to recover, but be highly socially connected. And we are very digitally connected these days, but very socially disconnected. And so modern life is not really what our genome was designed for. So I'm going to show you a little movie. It's a five second movie about modern life. And just let me know if anybody relates to this. Oh. Who's had a day like that? Like lots of days? So this insane busyness that we have is really not helpful because it causes a lot of stress. And what's happening in your brain when you're stressed is the amygdala takes control. So the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio showed in his lab that when you become sufficiently stressed, your amygdala can secrete chemicals out that shut down your frontal lobes. The thinking, planning, judgment part of your brain. Basically, your amygdala says, talk to the hand. I'm in control of this brain. He called it amygdala hijack. We all know it as losing our shit, right? That's what's happening in your brain. But then chronic stress is exceedingly bad for the brain. What we've seen with the advent of MRI scanners and following people for years where they image their brains, follow them up, ask them about, about the amount of workplace stress, and then image them again, is that people who report having significant long-term workplace stress, they have significant structural and functional changes in the brain. What I mean by that, the amygdala actually grows bigger and becomes more sensitive. That means people become hypervigilant. They start to look for stress and threat everywhere. And at the same time, the frontal lobes start to shrink because stress kills off neurons in the frontal lobes. Then people struggle to regulate their emotions and they develop this hypervigilance to threat. And there's some things that we're doing today that is actually not helping, that's supposed to be helping, but isn't actually helping, which I'll talk about in a second. So let's now talk about potential solution. So for me, um, being an ex-military guy, um, a good old pincer movement is what I think is required. Number one, all of the psychological safety, and I'm sure people have talked about that today, and that's really important that we bring that in. But for me, that has a bedfellow of increasing people's mental fitness. Because if they're not mentally fit, then they become overly sensitized with some of the, the stuff around psychological safety. Um, so what psychological safety is not, lots of people over these two days will talk about what it is. What it's not is it's not a shield from accountability. 
It's not not be having to have those tough conversations around performance. It's not a world that's devoid of stress and challenge. We seem to try to be sanitizing the world now, removing all types of stressors, removing offense, all of this sort of stuff. It is not political correctness and niceness, and it's not unearned autonomy. People don't have the right to work from home unless they agree with their employers. And it's not a decision by consensus. Business still needs to operate. So others will talk about what it is, but I just wanted to highlight what it's not. And one other thing that has really come out of the, the university movement in the United States is, is this pervasiveness of trigger warnings. And the latest research is showing it's well-intentioned, but it's having the opposite effect. Trigger warnings actually sensitize people to threats. They increase their hypervigilance and they actually decrease mental health, both for people who are mentally healthy and people who've gone through trauma. And that is what the evidence, a systematic review that was released quite recently has said. So we're actually doing stuff that is well-intentioned, but having the opposite effect. I think we need to, as well as having good psychological safety, is that we need to help people up the mental fitness continuum. And just to give you, at the, this end of the mental continuum, people are mentally sensitive and they can be mentally fragile. They engage in avoidance behaviors. They got psychological inflexibility. They can have anxiety and or depression. They often are very, very fatigued. They don't cope well, and at the extreme, they're burnt out, and they often self-neglect. And, and what we really need is to help people move up this continuum where they go from mental sensitivity to mental toughness. Mental toughness isn't a macho thing. There's 30 years of research around it. Women and men are equally mentally tough. The opposite is mental sensitivity. Um, there's graded exposure to stress. The number one treatment for anxiety and trauma is exposure therapy, not avoidance. Um, it's about developing psychological flexibility. It's going from anxious or depressed to mental vitality, fatigue to energetic, not coping to high performance, and self-neglect to self-care. And self-care is not sitting with your feet up with a bottle of wine watching Netflix. Self-care is exercise, good nutrition, good sleep hygiene, all of those things that actually are the building blocks of a healthy brain. Um, and so let's now talk about some evidence. I have just published a paper in the last two weeks uh, in the Journal Sustainability, looking at the, this is part of my PhD, examining the effects of multimodal physical and cognitive fitness training on sustaining mental health and job readiness in a military cohort. And um, so what we did as part of this is, um, this is the, the, um, the Navy fleet air arm. We took um, serving members from 808 squadron. So these are frontline squadron, squadron uh, of, uh, they, they basically do support helicopter. They were involved in all the floods in New South Wales. They were involved in the fires. And um, then they had COVID. These guys were under massive pressure and the commanding officer said, if you can just keep them alive, that's a bonus, right? Um, so here's what we did. Um, so there were 76 volunteers from the squadron. They were block randomized into, we did one was where there was a resilience training and the other one where they did that, plus they had some functional imagery training. Think of the sort of stuff that elite athletes do around goal visualization. Um, they were all volunteers, free from diseases, uh, and they went through a four-week program. Um, and there's where the ethics are. We measured their mood using the World Health Organization's uh, five questions on mood. We measured their resilience, and we also measured burnout using the Maslach Burnout Inventory, which are all gold standard. Um, here was the, the, how the program actually ran. They did the surveys. They did three hours of face-to-face -face training, then four weeks on, on, on an app that was designed to help them to create new habits and had lots of exercise, guided meditations, that sort of stuff. And then they did the retesting. So quickly to look at the results. Here's the results of their mental well-being. You can see that both groups had statistically significant improvements in mental well-being. And then if you dive into it a little bit more in the black, I don't know if you can make this out, but at the start, 15% 
were likely, had high likely mental well-being, and at the end of it, it was 53%. At the start of the study, 33% had problematic well-being. That dropped down to 11% at the end of the study. And then from a resilience perspective, again, both groups had statistically significant improvements. There was a tripling of high resilience and a halving of low resilience. And then in terms of burnout, um, statistically significant improvements in all three areas of burnout. So uh, emotional exhaustion dropped, um, professional efficacy increased in both groups, and um, cynicism decreased in both groups. Um, so that was around the military. I've also published in the ISSP journal, looking at the effects of the same program in a number of different workplaces. You can see them along the bottom here. Uh, and what we saw was very, very similar results. At the start of it, there was about 2,000 people went through the program. 12, nearly 1,300 took the survey at the end. Tr more than a tripling of those of high mental well-being. And problematic well-being went from 40% down to 10%, so reduced by 75%. And then resilience more than doubled, high resilience. And those with low resilience um, dropped in half. So that um, was the outcome of the study. But what do we actually do? Um, so for me, um, a, a lot of it was about exposure to hormetic stressors. So these are known stressors that, um, if we think about hormesis, is, is sublethal exposure to stressors or toxins which at high levels can kill you, but at low levels in, um, um, induce stress resistance, right? And there are three major hormetic stressors that we don't do very much. These are evolutionarily conserved stressors. What I mean by that is you see them across different species and you see them across timelines of evolution. And the three of them are exercise, heat exposure, and cold exposure. So to just give you a, a, a quick view on each one of those, why exercise is so important is that every time you're exercising, hormones are actually released from your muscle. They're these things called myokines, which actually get outside of your muscle and, and they have messenger molecules that impact positively on every single organ and every organ system in your body, and especially in the brain. A myokine called BDNF is released from exercise in your brain. It helps you to grow new brain cells, create new connections, and it protects the brain cells that you have against damage from stress and traumatic brain injury. What we also know about exercise is it improves your mood, right? Who knew that? Everybody in the room, right? And a University of Adelaide study came out just a couple of weeks ago showed it's at least one and a half times more effective for mood disorders than antidepressant medication. Um, and exercise also, you don't need to be a research scientist to decode this when I tell you that this is 30 minutes of a psychological stress battery. Right? And what they do is they expose these people to them. And the dark blue at the bottom are fit, active people. The light blue are unfit, inactive people. And here is cortisol, the major stress hormone. What is very clear from this is fitter people handle psychological stress better than unfit people. It's called the cross-stressor hypothesis, not cross-dresser, that's what I used to do in the military. Cross-stressor is where you increase your amount of stress in one area such as exercise. Not only do you enhance your ability to deal with exercise, but it spills out into your ability to deal with psychological or emotional stress. Um, and so that's around exercise. What we know, and there's about 50 research papers um, behind this slide, um, is around cold exposure either from cold showers or cold water immersion, improves your metabolic health, improves mood. They're actually treating people with depression, with cold water therapy. It improves your gut microbiome. Um, it also um, increases the mitochondria in both your fat cells and your muscle cells. And, and your mitochondria are like the batteries of your cells. And then when you turn the temperature to the other extreme, and you have saunas or a hot tub or a hot bath for 20 minutes, 
There are a lot of changes that happen physiologically, such as improvements in mood and insulin sensitivity, increased learning and memory. And the thing that connects exercise with cold exposure and heat exposure is the activation of stress response proteins. So it's about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because when we get uncomfortable and we activate these stress response genes, they actually make us stronger and more resilient at a cellular level. And, and it's best summed up by Friedrich Nietzsche. That which does not kill us makes us stronger, right? Brackets as long as we recover effectively, right? So for the, the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about the psychological or one of the psychological interventions we did with these guys. So I'm giving you just a, a very high level overview of the, of the program. Um, but this is about um, uh, basically the voices in your head. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Now I know some people here have got a shitload of voices in their head, but let's do a little thought experiment, right? This is normal everyday you. And we want, just want to talk about the two extremes. So put your hand up if you can relate to a version of you that's just a little bit shit. Anybody? Cool. This is what I call your inner gremlin. And it's driven by this sort of stuff. Negative self-talk. Anybody have any negative self-talk going on? Any humans in the room? Overthinkers. Give me a wave of the overthinkers, right? Also, this victim mentality. We're very good at that. Um, self-criticism. And it's where self-care and self-compassion spills over into self-indulgence, right? So just think of all negative emotions, unhelpful things. We're going to package them up and call them your inner gremlin, right? Now, if I was to give you a magic wand, you could wave it and your gremlin's gone forever. Who'd be up for that? Anybody? Right. Unfortunately, magic wands don't exist, right? And there are some approaches in psychology to help you to try to manage this. It's called psychoanalytical psychology. Come in, lie down on the couch, let's talk about your childhood, how you got screwed up, and we'll put you back together, right? Really effective for some people, and it screws some people up, and it generally takes a long time, right? There is an accelerator approach taken by three modalities that I'm a massive fan of. One is stoic philosophy. Right? So anybody familiar with the Stoics, the ancient Greek and Romans, which is actually the foundation for cognitive behavior therapy. Right? Uh, Albert Ellis, who created it, based it on Stoic philosophy. Um, as well as that, there's acceptance commitment therapy, uh, which is one of the, the new way of therapies that's very effective for mood disorders, and in Japanese psychology. And I know a lot about the last two because my wife was practitioner in them. All three of those modalities say, this is not about getting rid of your gremlin. You can't. It's a quintessential part of the human experience. And the difficulty comes when we pay too much attention to our gremlin, when we become very self-focused and we become, we get in our own heads and we struggle, as they say in ACT, with the struggle monster. The struggle monster is all these negative emotions and you're trying to pull this struggle monster into this hole, but it's a big, strong monster and you spend all day trying to pull it into the hole. You waste your energy and miss out on all of this stuff happening in the world. Sometimes we just need to drop the rope and walk away. And we do that by shifting our attention. In Japanese psychology, they say the most powerful thing that you have under your control is the flashlight of your attention. And I love that from a neuroscience perspective, because whatever you pay attention to, your brain will commit cells to. So it's when you're paying attention to your gremlin that the difficulties arise. Because what you're doing is you're feeding mogwai after midnight, right? And if you laughed at that, you're showing your age. So here's the alternative. Rather than getting into your own head and wrestling with the gremlin, when you notice the gremlin is in your head, and this requires self-awareness, you're just going to do a little experiment and go, ah, gremlin, there you are. Thanks for that story that you're telling me, but it's not helpful right now. 
That's the question you need to ask yourself. Not, is it right? Is it wrong? Is this helping? And if it's not, you shift your attention to what the Stoics called your inner sage. This is the best version of you. And I have an exercise around creating the sage, but basically how you do, how you close the gap is by leaning into discomfort. Nobody developed good character by having an easy life. You develop character by leaning into discomfort with the right attitude. And it's also about psychological flexibility, gratitude, and arugamama, which is this beautiful term from Japanese psychology that means with things as they are, what needs to be done. So my inner sage is called Jev, named after three people who I, 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 I really revere. One is Jim Stockdale, another is Epictetus, the Stoic philosopher, and the third is Viktor Frankl, um, whose book, Man's Search for Meaning, I read as a 17-year-old. But the point is, it's not really it's what's the name, it's the question you ask yourself when you're struggling. I ask myself, what would Jev do right now? That is a process in psychology that we call self-distancing. And it's been shown to enhance your courage and to improve your choices. So it's about creating this sage, writing down the character strengths of you at your best, and then visualizing it every morning. Because every day, you decide who gets out of bed. Every time you're faced with challenges, you get to decide who fronts up. Whether it's your gremlin who plays the victim, gets angry, looks for somebody to blame, or your sage fronts up and looks for the solution, and if there is no solution, does what the Stoics say and use it as an opportunity to practice a virtue or to sharpen your character. So guys, hopefully that gives you a little bit of flavor around mental fitness and the evidence behind it and some of the components of it. Um, If anybody's into podcasts, that's my podcast where I get to interview world experts on enhancing your mind, body, and brain. And that's my book, aptly named Death by Comfort, Why Modern Life is Killing Us and What We Need to Do About It. Thank you.